Should we start? I think you did. That's right, yeah. So it was always the um, thing that's best to be Okay. And up until the Good Friday agreement, so things like late Hi, everyone. Thanks for. Let's start. Um, this session is about UEFI. We started working on UEFI in. Uh, in Linaro, uh, leveraging on, on the strong cooperation with ARM uh, six months ago now, or a bit more. Uh, so we want to have this session, uh, first of all, uh, giving a, a short status update on where we are on uh, V7, the uh, developments and uh, achievements, and then uh, spend the time on uh, the next steps uh, which which implies how we are going to move on on V8 ARM 64-bit, and uh, have an open discussion on uh, on how to achieve that and the the priorities and features that that need to be there. So um, you have a good amount of the UEFI team here at Linaro. A few others are in the breakout rooms and may join during the session. Uh, so first of all, thanks a lot to all the engineers for for the strong efforts and and uh, good achievements. And uh, I well, I let Grant take the lead on the status update. And uh, feel free to ask questions uh, anytime, as this shall not be a broadcast but an interactive session. Thanks. Do we have a handheld? I'll stand up so everyone can see me. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll I'll start before actually uh, going into the stats. Just introduce the the team that has been working on UEFI for the, the last few months. Uh, Ryan Harkin, over at the the end, he is uh, our landing team and has been maintaining the UEFI tree. Uh, Reese, I'm sorry, Reese. Pollock. Pollock. Thank you. Uh, has been working on uh, TI assignee, been working on the network aspects. Uh, Leif Leitholm has been uh, working on Grub and maintainership of UEFI as well. And we have Yi Li from uh, Huawei, who's been working on SMBIOS, ACPI, and some of those things that we need. So the very quick and, status. And Stephen Kinney. Pardon? Stephen Kinney, who is not sitting here, but may join. Yeah, we, we have Stephen Kinney, if he's in the room. Uh, there are other team members, but this is this is who's on the panel, so they're the people who get, get <laughs> introduced. Uh, we've had got so far, and you can uh, we're going to be presenting this to the to the steering committee. But we've spent the last six months trying to get a number of things that we see as important for UEFI, specifically on server machines. So we're not trying to branch out into mobile or any of the other areas. This is specifically for server machines. We started this process trying to figure out what we thought the important features are, and some of those things are network boot. To be able to boot these things off the network is just really, really important. When you've got thousands of thousands of processors in a box, you've got to get it booted off the network. So something that looks like Pixie boot. Uh, we want UEFI to be supported as by Linux, at least as well as it is supported on x86. So things like if you're installing to a local disk, you want to be able to, from UEFI, actually do DMI decoder or actually um, do the EFI manager uh, to be able to set the boot variables. Be able to say, okay, I've installed Linux. Now here it needs to boot. Uh, we've been looking at these things. So the the status of where 
was loud. The status of where we are right now, uh, we've got, we've been working on a number of areas. Uh, Yi has been working on uh, getting, turning on SMBIOS, ACPI, and um, also the, the KVM support. SMBIOS and ACPI and UEFI, actually all the code's already there in the UEFI tree. The hard part, the, what needed to be done is actually turn it on for the builds that we're working on. Right now, we're focusing on Versatile Express and uh, the RTSM model Versatile Express. We do have Arndale support. We do have Pandaport support. We have Origin. It's broken. It's broken at the moment. We theoretically have Origin support. So we've got several uh, boards in the UEFI tree that Lenaro is maintaining. Uh, but most of our effort has been working on the, the ARM models because all of our focus, and this is really important for the work that we've been doing, our focus has been on getting the core code working. Platform support, we're assuming it's the responsibility of the members to do the actual board ports, but all of the core code needs to work. So uh, status now, we've got um, SMBIOS, we've got turned on. Uh, ACPI, we are working on to get turned on. Uh, DMI decode, both the internal, the, sorry, the user space DMI decode application and the internal uh, uh, SMBIOS parsing driver, all of that works. And we've got uh, patches that are going to be going up to, to mainline soon. We've been working on runtime services. So UEFI works on, um, uh, when Linux comes up, it will be able to recognize that UEFI is running, get the system table, parse the system table, and then be able to call into runtime services. The primary purpose of being able to call runtime services is merely to ins inspect and modify the UEFI variables. And the primary, primary purpose of that is to be able to set the, set the boot variables. Secondary purpose will be related to setting keys if we ever do secure boot, but we are not Root activities right now. That's just not something that we've got in the plan. Uh, <clears throat> we've got. Question. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to use the runtime services for console output, like early debugging? Is it possible to use the runtime services for console output? Yes. Let me come back to that. Uh, Roy, are you in the room? Roy's not here until Tuesday. Roy's not here till Tuesday. Okay. That's the next thing that I want to talk about. Uh, one of the things that we identified as a big deal is to make Linux nodes, to be able to have Linux support. And implement an EFI stub in the kernel. So we've got patches that are now, Roy's done a really, Roy France has done a really good job. He's got a set of patches that are going to be ready for posting publicly in the next week or so. If anyone wants to see them, they're welcome to. Uh, which embeds in the Z image wrapper on ARM 32-bit uh, a UEFI stub. And what he's done is taking the x86 UEFI stub, he has ported it over so that that code can be compiled for either x86 or ARM. It will come up, the kernel, or sorry, UEFI will recognize the kernel as a full EFI application. It will execute it. That little stub will do all the setups that's necessary for the way that the kernel wants to boot. Uh, it will retrieve uh, the memory map. It will be able to output to the console. So to answer your question, Arndt, yes, we can output to the console using, run, using boot services. However, boot services in UEFI, we have to exit. And right now, we exit that in the EFI stub. Once you've exited boot services, you no longer have access to the, uh, the console output. Instead, there needs to be handoff. And the handoff is on x86 machines, the way this has been typically done is with uh, an ACPI table called uh, DBG2. Uh, and there's an older version of that, which I can't remember the name of. But DBG. Just, just DBG, OK. Al Stone has looked at that. Al, put up your hand, wave. There we go. You can ask him about that, and I'll pretend to know nothing. So when that happens, there needs to be a handoff mechanism. And that's not one of the things that is one of the future items of work that this team and Alice ACPI team need to work together to figure out how to best handle the handoff of console, whether it be a serial port, which is easy, or uh, a 
frame buffer, which actually should be fairly easy too if it's already set up. But there's going to be handoff for Fair once you've got that frame. What's that? Third part isn't that easy because the, for the early debug output, there is we don't know where it is to be compiled. Well, when I say easy is if you've got a data structure, which we do, we've got two data structures. We've got device tree, we've got ACPI. Um, although I don't think I want to talk about device tree versus ACPI in this meeting. I think that why don't you save those questions? We'll talk about that another time this week. Uh, there is a debug for the structure. There is a exactly. And we can get that data. Yes. And we can know where it is. And more importantly, it's going to be a whole lot harder. It should be that the kernel can get output from the first instruction if it's if the kernel was hard coded with the serial port location. Best case is probably, or the best case would be the kernel going and looking at the table saying, oh, there's my serial port. Oh, it's a um, PLO22, PLO11, and then be able to write to it. So, uh, so that's, that's the EFI stub. That's going to be merged very shortly. The big advantage with the stub is it means that all of the changes, all of the setup and things that we need to do for supporting Linux can be held in that stuff. And that lives if we need to change requirements in the way the kernel needs to boot, we've got control over all the pieces. So that was that's coming close to being done. Uh, Grub is working and it works on we actually have Grub working both as a U-boot application and as a UEFI application. So the idea here is that it's available to the distributions to be able to install that to the fixed storage. And it also works as the bootloader for if you're booting over the network. <coughs> so for the, I won't go into the a long detail with the network booting, but the general model is when the system comes up to network boot, it'll go out to the network with DHCP to get its IP address and configuration. It'll TFTP an executable image to handle the rest of the booting. That executable image will be Grub. And then Grub has all the behavior already built into it to go out and get its modules off the network using UEFI TFTP, go out to the network to get its configuration file, go out to the network to get its kernel and the NetRD, and then boot. So that, that we've got working. Uh, patches are pending to get those merged. Uh, so <clears throat> the grub kernel handoff. So the Grub kernel handoff. I think now it's sort of implementing the, the same handoff that you boot kernel did, right? Could we extend the, the EFI model so that Grub loads all the necessary, necessary pieces and then hands off to the kernel still within EFI framework? Uh, good question. That's exactly what we've been talking about doing. In some implementations. That's, yeah, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out exactly what x86 does. And uh, when I switch over to talking about V8, uh, we'll come back to that question because that's actually a really, uh, really important point on V8. Uh, what else? We've got Grub Network Boot, SCT. ARM has done a huge amount of work on SCT. Uh, Stephen has taken the SCT work, validated that it, all, that it runs on the ARM platforms that we have. Uh, SCT, for those of you who aren't familiar, that's the uh, certification test suite for UEFI, available to UEFI members only. But we pulled it into the, the UEFI testing, and that's part of our maintainership and testing process. Uh, we are this close to having it in Lava. It took a while for us to get the Lava integration sorted out, but um, it's it's there now, uh, so we're, we should be in good shape. And then finally, uh, KVM. Um, ARM's also done a bunch of work in KVM, and there's been a bit of back and forth on exactly how KVM needs to work on V7. There was a little bit of a gotcha on K 
once uh, hypervisor support was added to v7. And that was, there's already deployed UEFI systems. So the UEFI spec could not be changed to support using hypervisor mode out of the box. On v8, it's no problem. The v8 spec says when you jump into the operating system, it shall be running at the highest privileged mo mode available to the operating system, and that's hypervisor mode. With v7, we've got had to uh, work with ARM, and uh, they've got they've got a proposal now on what the best way to do that is to make sure the kernel is when we jump into the kernel, we're running in hypervisor mode. There has there's a draft set of patches that he got up and running and tested that we were going to have actually in our demo image on Friday. We're, Arm is doing some, uh, Harry at Arm is uh, working on reworking those patches for something that's actually going to be suitable for uh, adding to the UEFI spec. Uh, but we're working quite closely with Arm and they've done some incredible work there. And when you say KVM, that also applies to Zen and VMware? Well. That and, uh, applies to all of them. So because we're, because we're trying to do things based on the EFI spec, We've got an EFI bootloader in the form of the EFI stub. Actually, we've got two of them because we've got Grub and we've got EFI stub. Um, three, if you include the Linux loader that's currently in the Tiano core tree. But I think everyone agrees between <laughs> ARM and Lenaro that we want to get away from that. Uh, for Zen, they'll be able to use exactly the same bootloader. The, the same plan is have an EFI application that implements the multi-boot protocol. Uh, Grub will do it for them. It should, and it's, we might need to do a little bit of changes to it. Um, so that's it. And then the last thing is network boot as well. Reese has done a whole bunch of really good work to to get us actual network drivers that are about to be upstreamed for uh, Versatile Express and RTSM. ARM had written um, a driver for Versatile Express, which we used as our basis, and uh, uh, did tested, did a bunch of bug fixes, and then have the another device driver for. Um, Sorry, what to say? We've got ARM did one for TC for Versatile Express, and we've got one for RTSM. So both of those, uh, we're working with Olivier at uh, ARM to get those upstream. So I think that brings us up to speed, up to date. Is there anything else that I've missed? Any questions on where we are at as of this moment? Perfect. Good. I can move on. So the the next thing is to talk about what's we're planning to do between now and the next connect. Uh, all of the work, or the vast majority of the work that we've done up to now has been all focused on 32-bit. And there's been some very pr practical reasons for that. The 32-bit spec was released. We had uh, all of the core ARM support code in UEFI was mainlined, so it was easy to get a hold of. Uh, Ryan has been doing great work with UEFI for the last year. Uh, so, so we had some getting some work done on that. Uh, there's hardware, you know, V8 hardware just is non-existent. There's the foundation model, but the foundation model doesn't even have real devices. It's got VertIO. We don't have VertIO patches for, uh, for UEFI. We can't talk about code. So we've done all this work because the expectation is most of this core work really is applicable to ARM v7 and ARM v8. The now that we've gotten to now that we're not very far from the UEFI specification being released, we need to switch over to V8. Most of our members are just, uh, in the steering committee are pounding on the table saying, "You got to be doing V8. That's what we actually care about." So the plan from here to the next connect is almost entirely focused on getting the same things that we had running on V7 now running on V8. So what we've done, and what we'll go into in greater detail, with the, that we've got more detail to talk about with the steering committee themselves, but we're taking all the features, figuring out which ones should just carry over, testing those, and then figuring out which ones need additional work. So what we've got so far is, and that page down low, so we'll just read through them. We have, we'll start with the actual booting of the kernel. Uh, the replacement of the Linux loader in UEFI. Uh, so start with Grub. Grub, based on a bunch of work with Grub, and just got familiar with it, but it took quite a while to get 
Grub, we got the ABI, all the things that needed to be done to make Grub run on ARM, and then make Grub run, run under UEFI. Well, a lot of those activities still have to happen again because it is a now a new ABI, it's a new instruction set. Fortunately, because we've done it once, it should be a whole lot more straightforward to, to put that together. So the first, one of the first big tasks is porting Grub to, um, to V8 and getting it running. Similar with the EFI stub. The EFI stub, you know, ArchArm and ArchArm64, two separate architectures, we've got about half the work done because Roy got it working on V7. And that is, all that code was uh, generalized so that it's applicable to two architectures. Well, now we're going to add a third architecture, which should be conceptually a whole lot easier, especially because Roy has the experience with working with the, uh, with the, e with the UEFI ABI. When's as soon as he's finished the V7 EFI stuff, which a week or so. Now, I say when is he starting working on it? I can't tell you when it's working. I, I can't give you a definite answer because I'm not the steering committee. You're on the steering committee, so you guys are going to figure that out. You're, yeah, we're, started last week, right? So we're, we're putting that proposal. We're bringing all the stuff that I'm talking about here in front of the steering committee. The steering committee is going to be making the decision about what we actually want. I'm not, I'm not actually, actually never right. Right. I'll introduce you tomorrow. Uh, the next thing is, um, OK, now with the one thing that's important to talk about with, uh, with the E5 stub is we realize that we've got a little bit of a gotcha on the V8 kernel. V7, we've got a, a Z image wrapper, a little executable wrapper that decompresses the kernel and then passes that on. V8, Catalan has made want the wrapper. He wants to depend on the bootloader to actually uh, uh, gunzip the kernel and then execute it. Well, the UEFI spec says nothing about gunzipping the kernel. It says you will run an EFI binary. So we've got two choices. One is, is that we always have a little Linux application separate from the kernel that takes care of uncompressing some, some binary image. The other is we figure out how to get that EFI stub into uh, a, a gzipped kernel, or we add a wrapper. Uh, what we're planning, I think what we settled on, which this conversation is still going on, that's something to work with Catalan this week. SMBIOS, ACPI, all of that work should just carry over like that. That one's easy. It's a matter of turning it on. Uh, however, when I'm talking about ACPI, I'm specifically talking about turning on the feature in UEFI. I'm not talking about the tables. When I'm talking about the tables, one of the jobs that we have this week is Yi and Al and the rest of Al's team are going to get together and figure out how to what data we need to get into the Versatile Express models so that we have a good demonstration and do it on V8. Uh, internal DMI driver, DMI decode, those should just port right over. There's no extra work that needs to, that needs to be done other than bug fixing. Uh, Pixie boot, that should just work. Grub is our application that payload, that needs work, <coughs> as I just talked about, but all the network boot stuff should be there and the device driver should be exactly the same. Uh, SCT, we know already works because we've got it working on on V8, and it's a, we've got it internally, even though we can't share it uh, with anyone other than UEFI members. Uh, lab testing, we expect to have up and running very shortly. Uh, and, oh, and I'm sorry, one of the things that I missed when talking about the status, uh, one thing that we did get done on V7 that we're going to bring over to V8 is we have a, a file system driver for EXT2, 3, and 4, which is really cool because it means that Linux distributions can still use the boot directory in the SD2 partition, and as long as the CFI file system driver is either built into UEFI or in the EFI system directory, and you just drop it in, it's just a file, you drop it into the EFI system directory, then it will be able to go and boot kernels off of EXT. Uh, no, off of the. EXT2, 3, 4. No, F2, FS. Uh, F, no, no one's done a driver. That's something that if the uh, steering committee says we need this, then you know steering committee members who are in this room, 
pound of wanted. We just don't have any engineering resources currently to do that. Uh, my KVM, we expect just to have to test because UEFI already has the stuff that's ARMS already done to work on that. And um, I think that covers it for the future work. Do you expect to have UEFI running in the guest? Both. Both. And right now, for, this, for the cards that we've written, for the work that we're planning to do, we don't have, uh, you know what, no, I lie a little bit. I was going to say we don't have the different cards. We do have a card for running UEFI under QMU. We've had, our, we don't have it as a priority on our schedule right now, which has been incredibly frustrating because there's been things that have kept pushing it back. Uh, we definitely want to have uh, UEFI running under QMU, both on V7 and V8. A, because it's a really convenient platform for develop, development, but B, because it's going to be useful to be able to boot an unmodified Linux distribution image in a virtual machine, uh, just as you can on XA6. You know, I, as you can probably guess here, a lot of our focus has been, there's no reason for gratuitous change between x86 servers. We want to make them look the same as much as possible. We'll only de deviate from that where it makes really strong technical sense to do so. Question? I was just going to make a clarification that apparently I'll just to say ARM will be also working on. Hi, Dan Handley ARM. Uh, ARM is also going to be working on um, the, the BERT-IO support on within the UEFI environment to, to load you know, network drives and stuff, which will unlock that use case that you're talking about, you know, within the UEFI within that. So currently our plan is for doing the V8. Uh, the, the foundation model, unfortunately, because it uses Vertido O and we don't have the drivers, we're not going to be able to use that as our as our baseline. Uh, we're going to instead have to use one of the ARM RTSM models that has you know, real hardware virtualized. But it sucks that we don't have something that's we can't use the foundation model that's available to anyone. Uh, so that's that's one of the what's the one of the risks that we have right now. As soon as we've got the Vertio drivers from from yeah. ARM, we're going to be all over those. Yeah. So. Focusing very much on leg is uh, some of the other areas that UEFI will be people talking about. There is some work going on right now for fast boot. Uh, our team has not been working with it. I've been talking a little bit with developers who've been as, as, the Android. as in the Android specifications so that UEFI can be used on Android machines. Uh, there are some conversations going on about you know, how how will UEFI best be used in uh, non-enterprise or non-PC type systems. Another question that has come up quite a bit to me personally is what about device tree? Is everything ACPI, or are we going to have device tree support? Uh, the way things work works right now with V7 is the device tree is still required, and it will be required for the foreseeable future. Now, what that actually means is that for the enterprise system, what what we expect is going to happen on V8 and V7, or on sorry, on V8 systems, is UEFI will provide ACPI. That's what the OEMs are pushing for. That's what the distributions are pushing for, so that's what's going to be provided. Uh, the reason device tree is still going to be in there is that Linux still needs a data structure to be able to pass information between it. I mean, you, you look at x86, and it's got this big loader data structure that says that allows Linux to add additional information. We're going to do the same thing with, with ARM. We've already got device tree support. It's actually really lightweight, so it makes sense for things like the device tree blob to be passed in that way. Uh, or sorry, it makes sense for the ACPI and the UEFI system table to be passed in through a device tree property. It may be that the device tree itself is just a tiny structure with only a chosen node in it, uh, but it will be, that's the data structure that we're looking at to be able to pass this data around. So how do you expect it? 
How do you expect to deal with a case where you have some devices described in ACPI and some devices described in an OF device tree and have them interact, like if you have we a don't. DMA controller and have the slave and the other one? Uh, we don't. You, just, you can take the, the mic back. I'll sit down now because I've stood up for a long time and other people can actually talk. Uh, we don't. The, the expectation is that the system will be, in those platforms, the system will be described by ACPI. Period. So, but how do you want to get there when currently everything's described in the device tree? To okay, that's a that's a separate question. Uh, how do we get to a world where we've got um, ACPI versus device tree uh, on V8? I don't know. Uh, I expect that it's going to be we're going to have a cutover, and I I think Al is probably a better person to answer that question on whether we're going to need a a phased in approach to migrate from device tree to ACPI or if it's going to be a cutover. Now the kernel itself is going to support both. The kernel, there's nothing preventing us from building a kernel that will boot on device tree or will boot on ACPI. That's not a problem, not a problem whatsoever. But for what the systems actually provide, Al, do you have any comments? So, so I will make the general statement that we're trying to make sure that if something is already using device tree that we don't cut that off right away, right? So some of the work we're doing on, on V7, we're making sure that, that regardless of, of whether a device tree or an ACPI plop is passed in, we'll use whatever information is available. To the extent that things are starting to work on V8, we're doing the same thing there as well. So for now, we're trying to make that kind of transparent, um, allow you to kind of do whichever. At some point, yes, we will have to, as a community, make a decision. That's it, no more device free, we're done. Um, but that'll be on, on just on the V8 side. Uh, I think we're, yeah, I, I yeah. think the OEMs are going to have a lot more impact on that decision than the Linux kernel maintainers. Well, yes, yes, I would agree. We don't want ACPI. Well, if, if that happens, then we are in a world where every system that we bring up, we need to either translate the ACPI data or we need to write device trees for those platforms. Um, you know, a third option is convince the OEMs to provide a device tree. Um, I, I've, I've been in the, the, the meetings. I, I understand what the, what's driving the, the, the push for, for using device tree. Oh, nice. Or sorry, to, for, for, for using ACPI. Um, there's been some major changes in ACPI where I was, I, you know, and you know that I was dead set against it uh, for, for a while. Uh, there have been changes to the ACPI spec that I feel a lot better about. But more importantly, there's changes on the ACPI governance where it's not a spec owned by five promoters. Now, that hasn't actually gone through. That's still in progress. Um, better about the process that ACPI is going through than I, than I was a year ago. The other cool thing to, to, to uh, just bear in mind is it's not something that the kernel can be Sure. It's actually, it's, it, it's actually not something the kernel community can decide. I mean, the kernel community can say, well, there won't be any code added that, that does ACPI and it all has to be device tree. But then the economic reality is that there will be servers shipped where you then get a choice like, oh, you, you bought a, an ARM server, you'd like to run an operating system on that. Do you want to get the Microsoft or the Linux version? Oh, I'll just, I'll just get an x86 server because it just works. Yeah. So I don't want that world. I want a world where <laughs> you get one server and you choose the OS you want, and we don't differentiate, and we say, you know what, ACPI is good enough, yeah, it's horrible, but you know what, it works, and we can boot other operating systems that will insist on it. Let's not try to create a... But, um, general purpose systems and enterprise systems like this are different from the, from the nice embedded bubble that a lot of us uh, embedded folks live in. 
meta bubble, we've got control of the whole software stack, top to bottom. Yep. In an, in general purpose hardware, you have different vendors, and you don't have control of the whole software stack. And that is a reality that we have to we we have to respond to. And our choices on responding to it are use the data provided by the by the system, or make the choice that we're not going to support those systems. Well, it also cuts the other way around. So if I, I think the argument will be made with a lot of people uh, that as long as we don't support ACPI on ARM in the kernel, that there won't be any distribution supporting ACPI in the kernel, so there won't be any hardware shipped for that, and that Microsoft doesn't get into that market in the first place because of that. And that, I mean, that I would be much more comfortable with Microsoft not being than us doing whatever Microsoft wants. You can't, you can't keep the Microsoft, yes. I, I, I will Intel say is, that very sorry, clearly. Because Intel, Intel wants to get into the embedded market, but there would also be the, the argument made about, by a lot of people here that we don't actually want Intel to be in that market. I, I just have to think, sorry, just to, I don't want to hijack this too much, but let's just, let's just play this out because you listen to, 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 to James and others giving keynotes this morning, and we can use the example there. You don't keep Microsoft out of the market by saying, we're going to do it this way, damn it. What, you, what happens is you do it, you do it, you say, okay, we're going to insist on device tree because that's what we want to do. What happens is Microsoft come along later, or whoever it is, and say, great, that's wonderful, we're going to build the servers this way. And then you end up with gratuitous fragmentation and differentiation because they will insist on doing it their way. So we have a choice. We can embrace what works on x86 and works today and well, use that, or we can force a fragmentation, which is what would actually happen. I'm going to take... Uh, uh, just, we're starting to run out of time, so I'll get Olaf make his question or point. But um, yeah. I, I think it's a little misleading um, because if you wanted to run Linux on these platforms, you just you essentially need to get one with UFI and have somebody do bring up. The sort of misleading thing here is that Linara is doing the work in preparation, and it looks like Linara is doing the work for Microsoft. While it's really just really um, preemptive preparation to do it, to get the ext3 code into Grub, get Grub going and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, it also means porting UEFI to the, all this hardware. And that's where I think things, some people think it looks a little odd, myself included. But it's something that's needed to do the base work for enabling the stuff on top. Yeah. See, so one of the things that I didn't realize quite how, quite how significant it was uh, is when I started talking with our members, with the, the OEMs, the ones who are driving the, the, the move to UEFI because they have tooling and expertise and training and you know, user manuals. There's a whole infrastructure that goes on behind firmware. Uh, and they went, well, why do I want? It's painful to have to support a completely different firmware solution uh, on ARM. When you're already changing architectures to change more stuff, it makes things painful. So uh, let's try to focus back on, on UEFI on the next steps. Any comments or questions or concerns about uh, our UEFI, what we're planning to do with UEFI? Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so my, my, my put to the steering committee was going to be um, I've got a pretty strong need in V8 to have a good boot solution soon built on EFI. So my strong takes some time. So and you and I are going to chat later, but but, but for, for thinking for, 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 for sort of initial thoughts, I was thinking let's get the EFI stub in place so that we can at least use gummy boot or some some other interim solution that lets us I am not a fan of gummy boot, right? But I'm pragmatic sometimes. Um, and uh, if there's some way that you can you can have a, a Linux EFI executable and you can put it on a system and configure it, I think that's the starting point. And then we do Grub2. So I'd, I'd want to at least prioritize getting the EFI stub in place as a top priority. The, the, the plan is to do parallel. Uh, it, parallel but, stuff, yes, but yes. if it's not um, resource contention, well, I would, yeah. What, what I really want to see happen is for the stub for V7, he now knows that code really well. Uh, he's done an incredible job on it. 
um, he would be able to knock off the, the V8 version very easily. We can chat with him just to the resource constraint I had there. Was, I've got someone, sorry. I, I, I happen to have someone internally within Red Hat tasked with port the EFI stub to V8. <laughs> so, I, I, so I regret not knowing about Roy's work, but now I know about it. Let's, well, let's, let's get Roy talking to your guy. Let's figure that out, because this guy was about to start doing the yeah. from scratch. So there's a port already that's great. Yeah, okay. no, let, let, let's get Roy talking to All your right. guy. Any other thoughts, questions? Uh, there are some other things, which is uh, about uh, secure boot. Okay. Um, all right. Well, what, what? What? Anything specific about secure boot? And other things. I mean, set up browser. For example, uh, uh, what happens when I try to update an entry using the shell? It is very cumbersome. So, a kind of user interface where I can select the user interface has my view image. I can select it. So, it's a kind of. Uh, I don't think we're going to have. It's unlikely. Just like, okay. Very unlikely that we will do any user interface work. In the in the UEFI team here, uh, no, it's not there's a, a couple of reasons. It's not for a that. high priority, but I think it's a good to do because when it's, you have to update it, like using the shell, right? It's very very cumbersome. If you want to update the boot into using shell, yeah. you give the options, and then it's very very long. Yeah, and a lot of numbers put in there. So. Well, the, the, there's there's two problems on that one, uh, or there's two issues right now. One is is that we're not doing secure boot. We're not doing anything for secure boot right now. Uh, I strongly suspect that once we've got all these core must-have features done, someone in the steering committee is going to go, uh, what about Secure Boot? Okay. So we will be looking at it eventually, I'm positive. Uh, but one of the things that's happened with EFI is the EFI spec has been very careful not to specify user interface. Uh, whether you agree to that or not, the upstream Tiano core isn't going to be accepting user interface uh, beyond the shell. And the reason for that is the bias vendors have quite a bit of influence on EFI and Tiano Core, and they don't want to they don't want to go down that path right now. And I, that's not a battle I want to fight. Now, there's other things that are more important. I mean, getting the functionality in place and stable is a bigger deal. Uh, I think it would be really intriguing and interesting to take Tiano Core and do a GPL fork of it for user interface stuff and that ports in things from U-Boot and some of the other features that would be that would be useful. Um, but that's the difference. That's not a project for right now. Aside from, aside from the secure boot parameter setting that you need yeah. to do on the shell, for, for just generic management, honestly, you could make a minimal image that you boot using EFI. And then you, you can use a space, you can set the parameters, and you could have a nice Fancy live live media booting solution if you want that. That will have to be really interesting. And I'm sure someone then they can be on ICC and um, and the only thing you need to shell for is is manually installing the trusted uh, path okay. with the right keys in there. But aside from that, yes. it, just do it with boot into Linux and use the EFI manager to set the parameters. It's yeah. much easier. Another thing is this option ROM. I was just going through some of the things. So, like your firmware is located in some like RAID or some of the disk controllers. So your UFI will load the firmware to initialize the, some of the devices. So they call it option ROM support. So is there any plan for that? Uh, option PCI has been a thorn on my side because. Need all the should be there for handling option ROMs. There's a very there's another big problem with option ROMs. It's x86 option ROMs. So if we're going to do option ROMs, you know, experience on PowerPC has shown that you know they used open firmware and they had an extension mechanism. And it was this had this bytecode that you can run, but no one ever did it. You know, you couldn't buy. You, you'd have a few, but it was a very small subset of add-on hardware that had the PowerPC open firmware option ROMs. All of it was x86 binary code, and the only real way to support that stuff was to put on a BIOS emulator. Uh, 
Well, now in an EFI world, if you've got an EFI option wrong, no, that, now there's the possibility of two different kinds of option wrong. One's going to be a BIOS option wrong. We've got emulators for that, so that's in the realm of supportability. There is an EFI option ROM that has EFI code. Well, then we'd need to emulate the 32-bit instruction set or the 64-bit instruction set uh, to get those to, to run. Then there's also the um, the bytecode. You can write option ROMs in bytecode. I'm probably being rather cynical here, but I have very little confidence that add-on hardware manufacturers are actually going to use the bytecode implementation for doing their option ROMs. I suspect the vast majority of it is going to be x86 code. So we don't have any plans right now to do option ROM work. Uh, that's probably something that needs to be discussed further at the steering committee. We had this conversation we were talking about here. I, I mean, I don't want to forget what I what I what I say. Um, sorry, I um, I also sit in the um, binding sub team for if I um, we had some conversations about this, and I think I think um, my own personal I'll just come up with my own personal input to that was was um, I don't think option ROMs matter in the first generation of systems because if you're building say so. Cards for these on it's not that it's not that kind of hardware not in the first generation so we'll get there but we can and by the way you've got three options you've got you've got the um, EBC EBC got you could have an x86 emulator yeah. or you could run ARM uh, 64 bit or or 32 bit code yeah so actually there's four so yeah yes. there's many options yes yeah, so EFI 32 bits x86 if I x86 64 yep. arm 32 arm 64 yes. byte code, byte code. BIOS. Yep. Ah. <laughs> or just recognize the card. Or just recognize oh, the card and oh, do, oh, do, oh. do yeah. yeah. Right and forth. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? We're, how are we doing on time? Uh, what time does this session end? At uh, one o'clock. Okay. Still got a few minutes, and then we'll just go for lunch. Pass the mic. Does Linaro have initiative to develop other boot loaders besides UFI? I'm thinking, uh, for example, for the A63 platform. The for, sorry, low, for which platform? <coughs> the 50, 53, the we low power. Have for example, I, U boot or other boot loaders I that are not think, so complex. I don't think. I think I'm overstating to say we will not. We don't have any plans to do U-boot on 64-bit. Um, this TSC hasn't asked for it. Um, I'm not hearing <coughs> anyone ask for it. And ARM has pushed very, very hard to make UEFI the standard firmware for 64-bit, regardless of the, um, yeah, regardless of the the target market. That being said. I guarantee you someone will do it yeah. well, because, I mean, U-Boot was never supported by a big company when it was written, and it was a very useful piece of software. Uh, I think there's going to be segments, but we don't have any activities on that right now. Go ahead, Mark. About old um, platforms, uh, what about supporting UEFI on platforms that won't have a secure mode? No problem. No problem. Right? Uh, platforms without a secure mode? We already have UEFI on those already. Um, so some of the so, aspects like A5, for example. So how would you handle runtime but, services when you compete for height mode with your with your hypervisor? Mm -hmm. runtime, runtime services has nothing to do with height mode. Nothing uh, whatsoever. It, it has to run it on. It run to, to run it at the same exception level as the hypervisor. Yeah, no. Runtime services runs at the same exception level as the kernel. The code. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, in, in fact, no. On x86, well, this is recursive. That's something. There are a lot of issues around what to do with runtime services, especially with height mode. Do you run it at the height mode level? Do you run it at the kernel level? As far as the UEFI spec is concerned. It just says, you will call this function to map the memory map. 
so that you've got, because UEFI will say, I need this memory. And here's my executable sections, and here's my data sections. Don't touch them, keep them around, and tell me where you map them. So the idea is, is that when you run your, I'll put all my x86 stuff over here in the address space, and I will call, or sorry, yeah, I'll put all my UEFI stuff into this part of the memory map, and I'll be able to call it directly. Now, one of the problems with that is EFI is a big software application, all written in C code, very easy to make pointer errors, very easy to not properly translate your pointers after that call to set memory map has happened. Uh, so one of the concerns is how do we protect about this? Uh, James was telling me that on x86, it has been a real nightmare because different, different UEFI implementations will do different things. So one of the things that we're talking about when we implement runtime services, uh, when we actually get the patches into mainline, is to uh, sandbox all of the UEFI regions into basically a pseudo user space process that we will only give that process the memory map that UEFI asks for. We'll do a unity mapping on it this is all very rough draft. This is just a concept that we're talking about. But the idea being that you'll change the MMU settings for when you want to run EFI code. EFI code will go, it'll do its stuff, and then it'll come back. There's one thing that really worries me, uh, which is you're going to, to start with UEFI running in hype mode. Yeah. Hype mode and the kernel have very different addressing capabilities. So, for example, you can't directly share mappings between Hype and the kernel. Uh -huh. they, they can only address 40 bits from Hype, and also 40 bit on the kernel side, but at the top of the 64-bit yeah. range. So, you'll have to find a way to translate all your pointers when you want to, yes. when you, you'll want to, to run code from UFI in EL1 or EL0, actually, is, would be a lot better. Yeah, we're going to need to do that anyway. Okay. And it might be that we have to run in height mode. Uh, that needs to be worked out. Um, there, we're going to hit all kinds of gotchas. I, I, I know that before we even look at it. So, so you said you wanted to do an identity mapping to avoid problems with code that doesn't expect to be remapped, right? Yes. I would su suggest doing the exact opposite and always mapping it to a random address to catch the software that, that doesn't have. But we will still need to, even if we do that, which is an interesting idea, um, we still need to we still need to change the mappings effective when we call into U5 um, because KHI because you can only do the remapping in UE5 once. You know, yeah, the remapping has to happen once. So that means that we need a strategy to preserve that memory map over each kernel boot. I really like the idea of sandboxing it off because then we'll catch pointer errors, we'll, we'll catch things that go off into the wrong place. Unfortunately, we've learned that on x86, on so, certain Apple machines, they can't do that because bugs in EFI go and do the wrong thing. I was opposed to the, the, the identity remap stuff. Yeah. Um. Very, very important for the Lonaro activities is testing. Yeah. That we need to be doing this stuff now. We need to be preparing for it, and we need to get test suites out there, yeah. um, especially in the form of the, the Linux, uh, Red Hat, and Ubuntu, so that because the use case on these machines is far more Linux workloads than it is anything else. Right. Like there isn't anything else yet. Um, that at least we have the opportunity to. Uh, to be the platform that's going to be tested the most. If we, by the way, if we need the binding clarified, so whether it's uh, EL2 or EL1. We need to clarify. Well, we don't even have a binding. Yeah. We, we, we need to work with Dan to get that, that clarified. Yeah, that's very interesting. There's been a discussion elsewhere about this. No, 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 not, not anything I'm significant aware. that you've been excluded. I'm going to Twitter right now. It's all quite new and interesting that this yeah. is what you're talking about. So. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I had been thinking about, you know, maybe we can just run in supervisor mode, but, you know, Mark talked about the fact that the mappings are different. It's like, uh, that may not work. But, you know, when Harry actually gets into implementing that model that we talked about, 
the virtualization protocol, the virtualization the, the protocol, protocol systems, yeah. where you he's, he's going to hit all these problems, yeah. yeah. He's going to hit them all. Yeah. And um, you need to make sure that code that does that transition over to height mode is in mainline and usable by all the platforms. Oh, sure, yeah. Because um, that's going to be hurt. That's going to be some fiddly code. Uh, I think, are we at the end of the hour? Yeah, we're done. We're at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good